Welcome to the wonderful world of wellness with Dr. Andy Mencia. This medical program heard from 7 to 7.30 each Saturday right here on WSBR 740 AM is brought to you by the Adult and Geriatric Center under the medical direction of geriatrician Dr. Andy Mencia. Mm-hmm. Well, good morning. Good morning, <laughs> Dr. Mencia. Happy Saturday. Yes, happy Saturday <laughs> as usual. When you're here, it's a happy Saturday. Ah, thank so you. So you have yeah. a great idea for our topic this morning. I think it's beautiful. Why yeah. don't you share that? Uh, well, you know, we want to talk about the integration of the senses. Um, we A lot of things that we either take for granted or that they start affecting us as we age. And we are not talking 70s, 80s, 90s. We're talking about 40s and 50s uh, for the baby boomers. And as those senses get affected, we, you know, sometimes we either... We are proactive and we say, okay, let me do something about it. I don't want this to happen to me. Or I don't want this to get worse on me. Uh, but other people just neglect. They say, okay, just let me try to learn to live with this. So explain so what the, what the, the senses are. The integration of the senses, you know, for example, your vision, right? With the vision, with the eyes, we can see what's ahead of us. Uh, so a young person can see right in front of them. But the young person has good peripheral vision. So uh, let's say you are uh, riding a bicycle as an eight-year-old girl. You're riding a bicycle, and you can see what is in front of your bicycle, but you can also see very well to both sides of the bicycle. So if there is something coming, you know how to hit the brake and and slow down your bicycle to prevent having an accident. As we age we get more of a tunnel vision. Now imagine this, having less peripheral vision, that means you can see less to both sides of your, uh, 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 in front of you, and you can see what is basically right in front of you. That, that's what we call a tunnel vision. So we get more of a tunnel vision. Now let's get ourselves in our uh, 60 or 70s or 80 and we're driving a car, and we're going to make a turn. When you're making that turn, you're only using basically your central vision Mm. because the peripheral vision is not as good as it used to be when you were eight years old. So if a subject is coming in one direction or the other one, you won't be able to see it until that person is right on top of your car. So Dangerous. uh, it's very dangerous, and that this is why you want to get your eyes checked. Now, let's go back to being normal and having great vision. And it, uh, the only time that we want to see a doctor is when we have blurry vision. <laughs> right. And blurry vision, that's no longer prevention. It's like you don't want to come and see me when you get a stroke. <laughs> okay. You want to come and see me when you don't have a stroke. So you say, okay, what does... Dr. Mencia need to do to help me prevent me from getting a stroke. And what do we do? We look at your blood pressure. We look at your cholesterol. We look to see if you have history, if you have, if you are prone to diabetes, family history of stroke. Then we go through the whole family history and say, okay, let me put all these pieces together. Let me put a puzzle together. And what can I do to take this person? and prevent a a stroke. And sometimes we say, oh, I'm immune because I'm 28 years old. Not true. You have to look at your family history. I had a patient, 35-year-old gentleman that came to see me, a very active lawyer, busy firm, and he came for an, he said, I just came because my wife told me to get an annual checkup. (laughs) (laughs) I say, okay. That's what happens to me. and I came fasting so you can do everything and get me out of here. <laughs> I said, okay. So as we start getting the family history, his father died at 45, 10 years older than him. Uh, and I asked him, do you know what, at what age your father had his first uh, heart condition before he passed away? He said, yeah, I think it was about 36, 37 when wow. he had his first heart attack. So I said, well, you don't want a quick visit here, young man. (laughs) 
we want to go over your history and we want to see everything we can do because you might have those genes from daddy and it's your job now with modern medicine to see what you can do. And he has two kids, you know, I say, let's see what you can do so that you can be around for your kids. So nothing happened to you at a young age. So I want you to forget about your firm right now. Forget about your job, your your clients, and let's take care of you. Let's give yourself some time. And that, so that's uh, called prevention, yes. right? And he fell in love with the practice. He said, I'm <laughs> going to send all my lawyers. <laughs> I said, don't send me the lawyers. Well, the I'm other thing, kidding. though, think about it. They're in terrible stress. They're, lawyers exactly. have a lot of stress. Lawyers so that even under adds a lot to of it, stress. It? Police officer, they're under a lot of stress. Uh, firemen, oh, you know, it's a lot of professional. They are nurses, you know, it's very stressful. They have so many patients to attempt to, attempt to, especially if you a nurse that work in a in a hospital, intensive care, and you have all this thing, all this alarm going off. You know, it can be a very stressful job. Those people, they go home and, and they crash because they are so tired. So let's go back to the senses. So when you go. You need to get your eye exam at least once a year just to make sure that there is nothing going on with your vision and, uh, but excuse and me, to but find what can out you do with, to prevent. You, no, no, but what can you do if you're having peripheral problems? Well, then, you know, there are vitamins you can take. We can check your, your, uh, the pressure of your eyes to see if you have any glaucoma. Uh, if to see if we have macular degeneration, there are so many conditions. But uh, you know, if it's not treating those conditions moving forward, we want to prevent them from happening. You know, what can we do to prevent those conditions from happening? And that's why when I do my profile of uh, uh, blood test, I include not only the traditional medicine uh, ex- examination in in, the, in your blood. But I do the non-traditional, the, the uh, homeopathic, the holistic approach to, to medical care. So we check certain vitamins and hormones to see overall how you're really doing. Now, you can have, for example, a person that under any one uh, judgment, your thyroid is good because nothing is being flagged. Now... It could be that your TSH, which is a hormone that comes from the from the brain, the pituitary gland to be specific, it comes down to stimulate the thyroid. And there is a range. You can be on the high end of that range. And then that hormone goes to your thyroid and stimulate your thyroid to produce other hormone called T3 and T4. When you get your blood test, we always look at TSH, T3, T4, and so on. So the T3 and T4 can be now on the low range of normal. So even though if you just take a glance at the test, everything you say, oh, nothing being flagged, I'm perfect. You are not perfect. You know, uh, the question is what would happen three months from now? If three months from now, one of those numbers now start becoming abnormal, Okay, so you are having too little T3, T4. The thyroid is not producing. The brain is going crazy trying to send you more or more of the hormone telling mm-hmm. the thyroid, come on, give me some more. So that because, you know, the thyroid gland have to do with metabolism. So you're feeling tired, you know, you're feeling constipated. You're getting a little ankle swelling. When a person look at that thyroid hormone without looking at the entire patient, what are the main symptoms? What are the things that are bothering you now? <clears throat> it's what we call a person developing subclinical, subclinical hypothyroidism. That means that it's not full blown where anybody can detect it. Uh, but if you practice preventive medicine, you know, this is uh, the type of person that you don't say, I, I want to see you back in a year, but I need to redo this test in three months because we want to see the, uh, the series of tests. And when you do a series of tests, it's like if you check your your sugar once in your lifetime. That one time, that snapshot, might say you are not a diabetic. 
you don't have any signs of diabetes or pre-diabetic or anything like that or borderline diabetes, whatever we want to call it. It's only one time. But if you do it every morning or if you do it three times a week, now you have a series of tests that we can analyze and say, you know, we look at the past three months and looking at your series of tests for the past three months, you have no signs of diabetes. The snapshot as well as the average of the past three months, it showed that you have no signs of diabetes versus just one shot, taking a, a, a single shot at anything. So when it comes to our senses, it's the same thing. You know, we need to monitor those things, even if we have no symptom, and specialists, especially, especially if we have no symptom. Mm. Because, you know, that's what prevention is all about. Uh, a person might have a decreased hearing. And sometimes the doctor will say, well, you know, it's your age. You're getting older. That's why you're losing your hearing. It's not true. Let's take a look in there. It could be that you are accumulating wax. And if we remove that wax, everything goes right back to normal. Uh, a patient might have a problem. Uh, and the thing with the hearing, before we leave that, you know, the problem with the hearing, imagine if you are in a conversation, three-way conversation, and uh, Richard is in there, you and I, and you and I start whispering. And Richard is going to start getting paranoid now because he say, why are they whispering? They're talking about me. They're talking about me. Or what are they talking about? How do I answer? How do I get involved in this conversation? We start isolating ourselves. So... When you start losing your hearing and we do nothing about it, it's going to affect you socially. You're absolutely you know, right, Dr. Mencia. When, <clears throat> when you start losing your vision, you don't want to socialize. Oh, we're going to go and play car, or we're going to do this, and it's going to be 8 o'clock at night. Oh, no, I'm not driving there 8 o'clock at night. It's too late because of that tunnel vision, and I never took care of it. I don't know what's going on with my with my vision instead of attending to so all of these senses become important for us to continue to socialize and to prevent us from becoming depressed. I want everyone to know that my guest is Dr. Andy Mencia, and everyone should know because that's why you tune in. But there may be new people listening. Dr. Andy Mencia is a geriatric physician. And let me tell you, he is located in Commercial Boulevard. He has his main office there. They also have another office in Boynton Beach, but let me give you the main number and to they call. they both open. They're, They're both open, open today. Both today. Both open today. And, and, and I'll tell you about that, but it's the phone number in Fort Lauderdale is 954-489. Remember, get, excuse me, I just want everyone to get their pencils out because these numbers are going to fly by you. Uh, it's 954-489-1345. And if you are in, not in Fort Lauderdale and you want to go to Boynton Beach, you can call them at 561-270-6494. I will tell you something. Dr. Mencia went to a lot of trouble. He had his major office at the center down in Fort Lauderdale, and he had enough requests. We want to start coming up to Boynton Beach. So please do go there. Uh, it's really uh, it's great. So, Dr. Mencia, I want to keep, continue with this. <clears throat> when you were talking, though, so we've, we've covered eyes and we've covered ears. Ears. But but there's also the thing that we were discussing before the show is to prevent falling, you need to have good vision and you need to have good hearing because if you're hearing everything, then you're being more careful. Correct. You don't Correct. trip when people are saying things to you. Right. Well, imagine, you know, there's a family gathering. The kids are talking. It's a different pitch. If you hear the pitch of children and the pitch of adult and the pitch of the elderly, there are different pitches that... People are talking to, and you might be missing the pitch of the of your grandkids. So they are talking. They are not whispering. They are just talking normally, and they might be talking too loud for everyone else with good hearing. Uh, so as you start l losing those different pitches, and uh, and uh, you go in the in 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 social event, you know you're going to have a tendency to want to isolate yourself. From other, and you become depressed, and then you'll go to the doctor, not because you have hearing problem, because you don't want to bring it up. You're going to go to the doctor because you're feeling depressed. You want to know what's going on. So the senses, with the vision and with the hearing, and 
And, and the have, vision, imagine in the vision, if you have a condominium, you have an apartment or a house that have different levels, right? So you have to step up to go into the kitchen or you have to step down to go into the living room. And the, the distortion of the 3D, the three-dimension distortion that your vision is giving you makes you more prone to falling. And That's, it's not that you are having a stroke. It's not that you are having a seizure. Like a lot of people get misdiagnosed with having a mini stroke or having a seizure because they fell on the floor and hit the head and lost consciousness. It could have been generated, created by the by your poor vision. Okay. Well, <coughs> I also wanted to go to something. Then I don't know what we can do about it. people lose the sense of smell. The sense of smell is very important. You lose the sense of smell, and those people, they start losing weight. Because when you're going to, you know, a good wine drinker, what do they do? They look at the wine, right? They want to hear the bottle, the cork open. You use all your senses to taste a good wine. And then you want to smell the wine, to smell the aroma. Well, guess what? When you're going to have a good plate of food, the sense of smell is what opens your appetite before you put it in your mouth. So if we lose the sense of smell, the appetite has not been asked to open up. Right, and so that is true, and then people are not eating the same way, but it's more than that. You will see where elder people, especially, uh, sometimes have a certain odor, and they're not smelling it, or they put too much right. perfume on because mm. they don't smell this. Right. So I don't know what you do about a sense of smell. Do you just, you've lost it and... Can you well, no, we want to, again, prevention. We want to prevent. We need to know, like, uh, are we having polyps in the nose? Uh, that we're having sinus congestion? Uh, are we having a post-nasal drip that we are not attending to, that we're just living because people think because we are getting old, we have to live with that? Are we having a GERD reflux, the acidity from the stomach coming back up? And when we think of GERD, the reflux coming from the stomach, we think of the esophagus. But a lot of people with GERD, with, a, with reflux, acid reflux, can have shortness of breath because that acidity is not only going to the beginning of the, to the uh, uh, lower portion of your esophagus. It goes to the upper portion of the esophagus. It goes into your throat. And acid do not belong in your throat. So it can produce a lot of damage. It can go into your lump and affect your breathing pipes. And people will have shortness of breath and they say, I never smoke. You know, I've never smoked, never been exposed to asbestos or anything like that. Why do I have shortness of breath? So all of these conditions can affect our sense of, of smell. And, and the consequences of that is when you go out with friends to eat, and they say, oh, this smells so good. And you say, like, what are they talking about? And like you said, you know, your own smell. You know, you might have a perfume that is too strong, but you don't even smell it. It doesn't affect you. But everybody else around you, you see them keeping the distance, you know, because their perfume is too too powerful. Right, but the danger is if you're, you can't even smell smoke. So let's you say you're in your, in your home right. and something is burning, right. you won't smell it. If uh, if you have a dead rat at home, you won't smell it. A dead rat at home. <laughs> if you misplace it, uh, you went to the supermarket and you brought the food home and you misplace the meat in a drawer instead of putting it in the in the refrigerator, and it smells like uh, 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 rotten uh, food in your house, you won't smell that. But when people come into your house, they like you know. And you think, you know, I'm very clean, I'm great, you know. So. But you miss that. So the sense, so that's what we started, the integration of the senses. So you're saying, though, as one ages, um, you can do some prevention. Maybe you can't be perfect, but you can start preventing this by having, coming to your office and having you do a complete blood. Um, complete examination, examination. Talk to your doctor and say, what are the things that are bothering you? And you don't have to be a doctor. And, I, you know, some people get offended when the patient come in. And because of that, they know, they get the feeling, you know, the patient get the feeling from doctors. So when the patient comes in, I say, well, doctor, I'm having these symptoms 
and uh, I went to Google and they joke around. I went to Dr. Google and uh, I found out it could be A, B, C, D, and E. And I'm proud of them. I say, well, you know, I say, good, at least you research. You, you know, you're trying to find out. And then it's my job to try to guide you in the right direction. I don't have any problem with people, you know, there are books out there. You can go to a library and get a book and, and read about it. You know, if, if, uh, if you have certain condition like Lyme disease, you know, there's so many people that specialize as infectious disease specialists, but uh, you don't see Lyme disease all over the country. There's certain area of the country that we see Lyme disease. So when I was in Mount Sinai, New York, of course, we saw a lot of Lyme disease, and we used to be a center to, and to why, treat why? patients. And why? Why? Because of the mountains? Or the because of the the the, the surrounding the surrounding, really? like Connecticut and New Jersey, oh, and oh. so there's a lot of ticks there. I see. So you see a lot of this condition. Right. It's like we don't see malaria here, but if you go to Africa, it's like getting a call for them. Okay. You know, they see it day in and day out. So uh, there are certain conditions that we don't see every day. But if you have it. If you know you have Lyme disease, a lot of those people, they do a lot of research. So when they come and they talk to me, some of my uh, pharmaceutical representatives, we sit down and we talk. I say, doctor, can I confide in you? I have this condition. And, uh, you know, what do you know about it? And I have done some research. And they tell me, what do you think of this treatment? What do you think of that treatment? And, we, you know, we chit-chat about it without being my patient, just pharmaceutical rep that come in for three or four minutes. But Dr. Mencia, I'm glad you brought this up because it's one thing to research, but don't take any of the things based on exactly. research. Please exactly. go to the doctor first. Go with your list because I want to just, I have to say this, you know that Charlie has a wonderful dog and he had diarrhea and a friend of mine said, oh, you've got to give him Pepto-Bismol. I, I said, she said, I looked it up. And I said, thank you very much. And, of course, I took him to the vet, and that would have killed him. I mean, so it's... Let me talk to you about uh, research. I remember about 11, 12 years ago, uh, this guy communicated with me to be an email. He found out my name and what have you. He called the American Geriatric and a young guy. And, he, you know, he goes by his name, Dr. So-and-so. So as we get becoming more acquainted, I say, well, what kind of doctor are you? I say, I'm a, I have a PhD in uh, neuroscience. I say, wow, you know, this very smart guy. So he wants to write a book with me about age prevention and this and that. And he liked the fact that I was into sport. And he says, such a rare rarity to find a, a, a master and a medical doctor that is practicing, and you do this and you do that, and, uh, you know, he researched me left and right. So I said, okay. And I said, you know, I happened to be coming to California to do a lecture. Maybe we should meet. I said, okay. So I tell him the hotel I'm going to stay and what have you. So, you know, you have this idea of the person you're going to meet. Right. Right? <laughs> this PhD, young guy coming in. The guy come with a flip-flop. Mm. with his nail full of dirt mm. in his feet and uh, disheveled. <laughs> and I said, well, are you working? And he said, no, I don't have a job. I said, why? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, the flag so, went up. So to, to cut to call, to call yeah. a short, the guy yeah. was a cuckoo bird. Wow. And I said, yeah. wow, but you know, look at all the stuff. But I said, how you put all this thing on the internet? Right. He said, I just grab pieces from different resources. I say, so sometimes, you know, like one of my my uh, manager used to say in the computer is like garbage in, garbage out. So if you go and you grab a lot of garbage stuff out there from the computer, from the Internet and put it together, people will read it. You You won't be able to dissect what is pertinent and real and relevant to your condition, and what is stuff that just been thrown in there. Yeah, you're so right. So, and so, you know, but I, I just want to tell everybody, because we're going to have to go, but the integration of the senses is the reason you should go to Dr. Taste. Andy Messia. What about taste? We didn't talk about oh, we taste. didn't touch, yeah. we didn't touch about taste. Well, we don't have the time, but we'll have to hit that another time. But Dr. Messia, the integration of the services. So go for your general checkup, even if you feel wonderful. Let Dr. Mencia do the blood test. Let him see ahead of time. It's called 
Prevention. And the phone number, make an appointment if you can this morning. He's there all day, if not during the week. It's 954-489-1345. Or Boynton Beach is open today, and they have a great nutritionist. It's 561-270-6494. And remember that they will come to your home if you have to, if and you, you know, are And you know which bound. one is the sense we neglect the most? We what? Have, we have one. Which one is the sense we neglect the most? Love. The sixth sense. The sixth sense. So we'll talk about the sixth sense next time. We'll talk about, <laughs> yeah, the sixth one. <laughs> thank Halloween. you. Oh, oh, thank you very much, Dr. Mencia. We'll thank talk you, with you next week. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Wonderful World of Wellness with Dr. Andy Mencia. Be sure to tune in each Saturday morning from 7 to 7.30 right here on WSBR 740 AM.